history students. This is your very last lecture of historical content. Let's get to it. If you're looking at this image right now, you're seeing the image of two men. The man on the left is the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, from President of the United States from 1981 to 1989. On the right is Mikhail Gorbachev. He was the last leader of the Soviet Union, the General Secretary of the Central Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And he was the Soviet leader from 1985 until his resignation on December 25th, 1991. His picture was taken in a European country that I don't really get a chance to talk too much about, Iceland. His picture was taken in Reykjavik, Iceland in 1986. We'll talk about that. All right, but let's take it back to where we left off in the previous lecture, 1980. 1980 left us with a Václav Havel being placed in jail by the Czechoslovak government for being a dissident and, in particular, for his partic participation in Charter 77 and for his essay, The Power of the Powerless. In 1980, there was a spirit of détente in the Cold War. Détente. It's a French word. It means a relaxation of tension but we could understand it as a peaceful coexistence or a live and let live attitude. When we got to 1975 in the Helsinki Accords, which is probably the best example of detente, there seemed to have been an acceptance by both the Soviet Union and the United States of America to accept that part of the world was going to remain forever more communist and the other part of the world was going to remain forever more democratic and capitalist, and that neither side was going to interfere with the governments of other countries, and that there was this general acceptance of this new balance in the world. <clears throat> so obviously, detente didn't last. Here we are in the 21st century, and the Soviet Union is no more. So just ask yourself right here, what might have happened? Obviously, detente is going to get shaken up a little bit, and that shakeup is going to happen in the 1980s. All right. So let's first take it to Poland. Check out these two guys if you're looking at your screen right now. What a great picture. These are two Polish coal miners in the, in the year 1980. Life as a coal miner in Poland was not good in 1980. I don't know, is, is it ever good to be a coal miner? Always seems to me like a dangerous job. But these coal miners were not paid enough to take care of their families. So what do you what do you do if you're if you have a job and you feel like you're stuck at this this job and you don't feel like you're getting paid enough or taken care of enough to be able to survive or at least to have a moderately decent lifestyle? Well, you get together and you form a union, which is exactly what these guys did. In Poland, up north in the city of Gdansk, a workers' union was formed which was called Solidarity. Solidarity, the workers' union that formed in Poland in the early 1980s. This is going to shake things up a little bit because you were not allowed to have a union in Poland or anywhere in the Soviet world or in the communist world. The whole idea of communism was that the state takes care of the people. The government takes care of the people, so there should be no need for unions. So how is the Polish government and the Soviet Union going to respond to the formation of this very popular trade union in Poland? Now, it's also important to know the leader of Solidarity. His name was Lech Walesa. Lech Walesa was a very popular hero of the common worker in Poland in the early 1980s. And what a bold and daring man he had to be to be the leader of Solidarity. He had to have known, becoming the leader of Solidarity, that he was essentially putting his life on the line. He could be executed for being the head of an organization that the Communist Party saw as subversive. But what's amazing was this. The government of Poland in Warsaw was willing to sit down with Lech Walesa and to talk about the needs of the Polish workers. But the Soviet Union wouldn't stand for that. So, in 1981... In came the Soviet tanks. Solidarity was declared an illegal organization, and Lech Walesa was placed in jail. So the most popular man in Poland at the time, Lech Walesa, the most popular organization in Poland at the time, Solidarity, are both considered to be subversive by the Soviet Union. So if you're Polish, how do you feel about this? This is a man who's working hard and putting his own life on the line to provide a better life 
for the workers of Poland. And he is now in jail. There is a very clear sense that your country is not free. It is very clear that your country is under the thumb of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union probably doesn't care too much about the common worker in Poland. But Lech Valencia was also not the only Polish hero of the 1980s. Coincidentally, the Pope was Polish. Pope John Paul II, who is sometimes in, informally referred to as Pope JP II, became the Pope in 1978. And get this, guys, he's the first non-Italian Pope since the year 1522 at the dawn of the Reformation. Here you have this Catholic Pope, the leader of the Catholic Church, and he openly speaks out in favor of Lech Valencia and against communism because, well, if you remember, communism is an atheistic form of government. Karl Marx said that all religion is the opiate of the masses, that essentially all religion is superstition. And the Pope naturally denounces that and the totalitarian uh, regimes of the communist system. Okay, going all the way back to the Reformation students, Poland has remained a staunchly Catholic country. To be Polish, for many people, is to be Catholic. So now if you're Polish, your hero Lech Valencia is in jail because of the Soviet Union, and the Pope is openly denouncing communism. What's that mean for you? Well, pretty much it means that the Catholic Church is going to be an underground dissident organization in Poland. And in fact, many Christian churches, Protestant churches like the Lutheran Church in East Germany and the Catholic Church, are essentially going to serve as underground headquarters for dissident movements throughout the 1980s. Historians like to debate what role John Paul II actually played throughout the 1980s in helping to end communism. Suffice to say that he did inspire people to reject the communist system, people who were Catholic, because if you're Catholic, obviously, you respect the Pope. If the Pope says communism's no good, that's probably going to influence you to a certain degree, depending upon how Catholic you are. All right, so there's Poland. Going back to the Soviet Union, remember this guy is the head of the Soviet Union at the dawn of the 1980s. His name is Leonid Brezhnev. Now, if you remember in 1968... When Alexander Dubček became, became the head of Czechoslovakia and tried to implement socialism with a human face, which inspired a movement led by students to support this new form of socialism in Czechoslovakia, that Brezhnev sent in the Warsaw Pact tanks and they crushed this movement and took Alexander Dubček they did not execute him because Alexander Dubček said do not resist the tanks, but rather they demoted him to a low-ranking forestry official and they placed him out in eastern Slovakia. So he's still alive, but the Soviet Union put a pro-Soviet leader in charge of Czechoslovakia, somebody who did not support socialism with a human face. And Brezhnev justified his action with something that is now known as the Brezhnev Doctrine, a very important document in the Cold War era. And essentially the Brezhnev Doctrine, which I've summarized here, says that the USSR may intervene in any communist country to prevent the spread of capitalism, or what they identify as the subversive forces of capitalism in that country. And the Brezhnev Doctrine motivates the Soviet government to intervene in another very important country in the year 1979, and that country was Afghanistan. All right, Afghanistan. You've probably all heard of Afghanistan. It is a country that is located in the Himalayan mountains. It is tucked in between Pakistan and India to the south and the USSR to the north. And in 1978, there was a new communist government that took over uh, the capital of Kabul in Afghanistan. And this communist government wanted to modernize Afghanistan. So they began implementing modern reforms, which upset, and they're communists too, so they are atheistic. This upset the traditional Muslim 
population of Afghanistan that wanted to keep Afghanistan a more conservative country. So this led to civil war, and in 1979, the following year, the Soviet Union shows up to, of course, support the communist government in Kabul. When the Soviet Union shows up to support the communist uh, government in Kabul, this is seen around the world as an invasion, and also a clear violation of the Helsinki Accords. Now, from the Soviet perspective, it's not a violation of the Helsinki Accords. Afghanistan's communists. We're helping out our fellow commies. <laughs> if you can call them that. And, and, uh, but, but for the rest of the world, it's like, no, there was a civil war going on here. You're intervening on the side of one side, the communists. You are helping to spread communism. So, okay. So, on the other side, this traditional conservative Muslim population calls out to the world, this is a holy war. These communists are trying to take over. Here comes the Soviet Union. They're invading our country. They want to er eradicate our lifestyle. This is a holy war. This is a jihad. For those of you who believe in protecting the Muslim faith in Afghanistan, come to Afghanistan to help us fight. And many Muslims, Sunni Muslims from around the world did. And here they are. They were called the Mujahideen. The Mujahideen. These are the Muslim freedom fighters who believe in fighting the Soviet Union. Of course, how do you fight the Soviet Union? The Soviet Union has a huge military. Well, obviously, whenever you're fighting a huge military, you're going to engage in guerrilla warfare, hit-and-run guerrilla warfare, and that's what the Mujahideen develops. And their method of fighting is simply hit-and-run, 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 hit-and-run until you wear these Soviet soldiers down. It's going to be a war of attrition. Who gives up first? And the Mujahideen, motivated by their faith, genuinely believe that they can wear down the Soviet machine. And this is why, even at the time, a lot of people looked at the, so the Soviet war in Afghanistan as their version of our Vietnam War. You know, it's like the United States military versus the North Vietnamese military. It's like, well, we should have won easily there in terms of our military capability. And the same with the Soviets versus the Mujahideen. It's like, the, the Mujahideen have nothing compared to the Soviet Union. Just like the... Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese army had no strength compared to our military strength, but the Soviets are going to lose in Afghanistan and we lost in Vietnam. And there are quite a few parallels that happen. Uh, the Soviet war in Afghanistan is considered to be their Vietnam war. All right, so hopefully that little simile there made sense. Back in 1979, did the United States respond at all to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan? Well, sort of. Our president of the, of the United States at the time was President Jimmy Carter, a Democrat from Georgia. Does President Carter support the Mujahideen, these conservative, militant, Islamic freedom fighters? No, not exactly. However, the one thing that he did was he said that the United States of America was going to boycott the 1980 Summer Olympics, which were to be held in Moscow, as a sign that the United States of America does not support the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. This didn't go over very well for President Carter politically because many Americans were like, why are we not participating in the Olympics? You know, if the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and we're angry with them, can't we at least, you know, kick their butt in basketball? But for President Carter, this was a symbolic act. The United States of America was not going to participate in the 80. Uh, Summer Olympics. Uh, the Winter Olympics are in the United States at the time. This was back when the Winter and the Summer Olympics were happening uh, on the same year. I mean, now they're two years apart. We, we hold these on, 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 two, on yeah, different years. And uh, the 1980s Winter Olympics were held in Lake Placid, New York. And that's where the famous Miracle on Ice happened, where the United States hockey team defeated the Soviet hockey team and probably the most celebrated hockey game in the entire history of hockey. All right, but what about Afghanistan? Well, we will come back to Afghanistan later. The United States is not involved in Afghanistan, though, during the Carter administration. All right, 
Also in the end of the 1970s, this individual becomes the first female Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Her name was Margaret Thatcher, and boy was she a conservative. Conservative how? Well, aside from very radical economic reforms that she implemented in the United Kingdom, which mostly were targeted at getting rid of trade unions in, in the United Kingdom, and isn't this funny? For me, I think this is kind of interesting that trade unions were seen as subversive on both sides of the Iron Curtain. But never mind that. Aside from the economic reforms uh, she makes in her own country, she also wants to strengthen the United Kingdom. One thing that I have not talked about is after World War II, uh, many European countries that had empires, and certainly the UK had an empire, uh, they began letting go of their empires. And this was the era of decolonization. That ends with Margaret Thatcher. With Margaret Thatcher, she is going to protect her empire, or rather what is left of the United Kingdom's empire. She also is passionately in favor of a nuclear arsenal. So there's no detente with Margaret Thatcher. We are British, we will have nuclear weapons, and we will have a lot of them. All this talk about getting rid of, you know, that some people are engaged in, about getting rid of nuclear weapons, she doesn't believe in it. She thinks that's preposterous because essentially the nuclear genie is out of the bottle. If the United Kingdom got rid of all their nuclear weapons, then they would become vulnerable to a country that did develop a nuclear weapon. So she says that's silly. The, United, the, the UK is going to have nuclear weapons. All right, and in terms of protecting our empire... The UK flexes its muscles in sort of a far-off distant island or, uh, or a group of islands. The Falkland Islands are off the coast of South America. They were a contested region between Argentina and the United Kingdom. When Argentina officially declared that the Falkland Islands were theirs, Margaret Thatcher doesn't declare war because she doesn't think she has to. For the Falkland Islands are ours she says, so therefore she can dispatch her military there to defend the Falkland Islands. A short 10-week war ensues between Argentina and, U and the UK. The UK easily win this war. And this was the United Kingdom under Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, flexing its muscles and saying, we will maintain our empire, or what's left of it. All right, so this whole spirit of detente starting to get shook up a little bit as we go into the 1980s. The spirit of live and let live, of peaceful coexistence, mm, might not last. And if there's any one individual who showed up to completely rupture detente, it was the President of the United States of America, and elected in November of 1980, takes the oath of office in January of 81. This is President Ronald Wilson Reagan. He does not believe in detente. In fact, I've got a great quote here from President Reagan. President Reagan said, detente? Isn't that what a turkey has with his farmer until Thanksgiving Day? Hinting that perhaps a grand reckoning is coming between the USSR and the United States of America. A little bit of a background on President Reagan here. And this is just a little bit. This is not United States history class. This is European history class. But let me just do a little bit here. Ronald Reagan was a former actor who was the son of two actors. Both of his, both his mom and dad were in the entertainment business. Um, Reagan's dad was a bad alcoholic. And a lot of biographers have done some psychoanalysis on uh, Ronald Reagan as, as the son of an alcoholic. And how Ronald Reagan would use comedy and his quick wit to deflect having in any conversation about his own personal feelings about anything. So, in other words, Ronald Reagan certainly was a whole lot of fun to be around, but you never really got to know the man personally, according to at least one of his biographers. Uh, Ed, Edmund Morris, his biographer, really kind of describes Ronald Reagan in that way. Okay, but Ronald Reagan grew up uh, in the Great Depression, World War II era. He was a young man. Um, and he was a big supporter of the Democratic president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, or at least in his style of leadership. But after Franklin Roosevelt uh, passed away, Ronald Reagan became a conservative, leaves the entertainment business, goes into politics, ends up because of his, and I mean, he was, he was an actor. Um, he made Hollywood films. He was tall. He was handsome. He was well-spoken. He was well-known. 
And so this made for an easy transition into, into politics because people knew him. And he ended up becoming the governor of California during the 1960s. And then in 1976, when he ran for president, he was, he was running against an incumbent Republican president, Gerald Ford, and was critical of President Ford for not being conservative enough. After the Carter years of the late 1970s, Ronald Reagan gets elected president. And even though he was one of the oldest presidents who's ever been elected, he was 70 years old at the time, he was still seen as tall, handsome, very eloquent, and this tough, cowboy-like, patriotic conservative that appealed to a lot of Americans. And as opposed to President Carter before him, Ronald Reagan was, was, op, spoke openly against communism. And in 1983, even spoke to a group of evangelical Christians in Florida about how the Soviet Union is an evil empire. And this is very Ronald Reagan-esque, um, and this is really sort of in our own political history, defined the Republican Party ever since Ronald Reagan. Well, there's no gray area for Ronald Reagan. Um, you know, it, he's very different from like Richard Nixon, who like opened up relations with China. For, for Ronald Reagan, there's good and there's bad, and you have to be on the side of good. So Americans are good because we have a capitalistic economy uh, and a democratic system of government with with multiple political parties and and the and communists are evil and we must eliminate uh, uh communism uh, it's also worth noting that ronald reagan was also a very religious man and he hadn't been president but a couple of months in march of 81 an assassin tried to take him out and really uh hurt president reagan and and, and president reagan v really very lucky to get away with his life. His bullet ricocheted off a rib, missing his heart within millimeters. And then the surgeons had difficulty extracting the bullet. And after that, Ronald Reagan really felt that his life had been saved by God and that he had this real high, higher calling that he had to abide by. And that higher calling was to get rid of communism. So, you know, go figure, two years after that, he's given speeches like this. Communism is evil, evil, evil. There's no gray area here. There's no detente that we can agree to. We must get rid of communism. And Ronald Reagan's thinking is very similar to that of Margaret Thatcher. We need to build up our nuclear arsenal. We need to have a strong, powerful military. So he begins talking about building up our military arsenal and developing new weapons of war, like this cool thing right here, the B-1B, which flies half the speed of sound, faster than any other plane can chase it. And it's a bomber, so it can you know fly in twice the speed of sound, bomb a place, and get out and nothing can, nothing can catch it. So the United States of America begins pouring money into its defense spending. And it seems like, and we're bringing back the Cold War. This, the spirit of detente is absolutely gone. This initiates a series of protests against the buildup of nuclear arms, which is happening mostly in Europe. So the United States is putting its nuclear weapons in the NATO countries in Europe, and the Soviet Union is putting its nuclear missiles in the Warsaw Pact, uh, countries in Europe. So Europe's like going to be ground zero for a nuclear war. Go figure this sparks a whole bunch of nuclear arms protests like this one in the capital of West Germany, Bonn in 1981. So the spirit of detente has been sucked out of Europe. The arms race is back. The Cold War is back on. People are feeling tense and scared yet again. Now, here comes a fun part of the story. In 1983, in the United States of America, there was a made-for-TV movie that was called The Day After. The Day After is what life would be like in the United States of America after a nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union. Now, if you grew up in the Cold War era from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, or during that period of time, there were a whole bunch of post-nuclear apocalypse films and what life would be like. But The Day After was... A little bit different, uh, not just that it was a made-for-TV movie with all these warnings like, you know, there's graphic images in this, you know, parents, you know, make sure children are, you know, out of the room, which only made little kids like me want to watch it even more. But, you know, the day after was a little bit different in that scientists were involved to show here's exactly what will happen. Um, so it wasn't just left up to somebody's imagination. Oh, here's what life might be like after a nuclear exchange. Scientists were advising this, uh, the, the creation of this film, showing, no, here's exactly what will happen if there's a nuclear exchange. The uh, film, for what it's worth, takes place in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, because it was a city, it was a, a university, it's a university city, 
uh, which was not one of the primary targets of the Soviet Union, uh, should the Soviet Union strike the United States of America, um, a, a city that was on that 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 would have been a strike city, uh, Dayton, Ohio, because of the Air Force base there, and also Columbus, Ohio, because of our defense. Uh, I forget what it's called. The Defense Center Supply, <laughs> the Defense Supply Center, it's in Whitehall in Columbus. Anyways, that would have been a target too if the Soviet Union had a struck. So we would have been hit. But um, but Lawrence, Kansas would probably have been spared. So it would have been what life would have been like for people in Lawrence, Kansas watching these mushroom clouds go up all around them, but they wouldn't be part of the direct hit with how their lives would have changed with the radioactive fallout. Anyways, it's a, it's a scary film. Um, and the fact that it's, based upon here's what really probably would have happened, really made it a very harrowing film to, to watch. And one person who watched this film was the president of the United States of America. And again, I, I consult uh, one of Ronald Reagan's historians, Edmund Morris, who was with the president uh, throughout the 1980s, interviewing him. Um, Edmund Morris said that Ronald Reagan was, prof it w was really upset and actually became very depressed after watching this film. And was actually inspired by this film to make sure that this would never happen to the United States of America. Now, a lot of biographers have fun with this because this is a former Hollywood actor who's now the president of the United States of America who was inspired by a made-for-TV movie to, to make a major... Uh, to, well, not really make a policy change, but to engage in a major initiative for the United States of America. Okay, and this initiative was called the Strategic Defense Initiative, the Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI. And here's what SDI was designed to be. This was Ronald Reagan's vision of how he could defend the United States of America from any nuclear attack. So I'll put this graphic image up from uh, the early uh, 1980s. In the early 1980s, there had been developed Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, or ICBMs. These missiles, which could be launched from one continent, they would go up into outer space and they would descend upon another continent and strike that continent. So you could fire a missile from the United States, it could hit the Soviet Union, and vice versa. Reagan's vision was this. He wanted to create satellites that could be launched into outer space. They would hover over the United States of America in outer space. They would be equipped with laser beams and they would be able to recognize and hone in on any ICBM that had been launched from anywhere in the world and was coming towards the United States of America. And these satellites would just sort of hone in on that incoming missile. It would just see the missile and dit, 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 hone in on it and then zap it. Zzz, and blow it up with its laser beam. That was SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative. Now, when this was presented, we did not have the technology or the artificial intelligence or anything to do this. This was simply a dream, and a scientist told Ronald Reagan that it's going to cost billions of dollars. It wouldn't become operational before the 21st century, but Reagan was adamant about it. No, start developing it. Start developing it now. And Congress approves the development of SDI. Now, that, this is back in the early 1980s. We find out that we're going to put laser beams in outer space. SDI was quickly nicknamed Star Wars for obvious reasons. The film series that had come out in the mid-1970s was very popular in the early 1980s, as it still is today. And this idea of putting laser beams on satellites in outer space just made people call it Star Wars. Now, from the Soviets' perspective, it's like, wait a minute, the United States of America is now going to take the arms race into outer space. The Americans are going to start putting weapons into outer space. For the Soviets, this is a very aggressive act on the part of President Reagan. Now, President Reagan would say, no, it's defense, it's defense, it's defense. But that is not how the Soviets saw it. Okay. The Reagan administration's response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Let's go back to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. All right, so you remember from a few minutes ago that the Mujahideen are the conservative, traditional Islamic 
freedom fighters for Afghanistan who have called for a jihad or a holy war against the Soviet Union, and Muslims from around the world who believe in protecting this traditional conservative Islamic way of life in Afghanistan have now flocked to Afghanistan to fight guerrilla warfare style against the Soviets. And the Mujahideen are the Afghan Muslim freedom fighters. One individual who joined the Mujahideen came from Saudi Arabia, and this is him right here. His name was Osama bin Laden. You have all heard of him. Or at least I hope you've all heard of him. Originally, he was part of the Mujahideen. He grew up in Saudi Arabia in what could be identified in Saudi Arabian terms as a middle-class family. But he came to join the Mujahideen to help them fight to free themselves from the Soviet Union. So Osama bin Laden is there. Another person who shows up to Afghanistan in the early 1980s was this particular American. He was a news reporter named Dan Rather. Now, there were quite a few... American reporters who would go to Afghanistan to report on the situation in Afghanistan. And Dan Rather's report, like many of these reports, were rather touching. It was about these, you know, common people living in Afghanistan who are going to lose their way of life. Communism is going to come in, take over, make Afghanistan an atheistic communist country, and the rest of the world seems helpless to stop this from happening. All right, so because of these news reports that are coming into the United States of America, this particular unlikely individual decides to do something. His name was Charlie Wilson. He was a member of Congress uh, from Texas. Uh, he was a bit of a party boy. He was known as Good Time Charlie for his wild lifestyle. And he was rather upset by Dan Rather's report and all these other reports that are coming in. Why aren't we doing anything? So Charlie Wilson goes to the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. These are our spies that are collecting information. And he says, let's do something. Let's start secretly supplying the Mujahideen with the military equipment they need to fight the Soviets. So Charlie Wilson wants to get the United States of America secretively involved in the Soviet-Afghan war. Here's a picture of Charlie Wilson with some Mujahideen fighters. Here's a very interesting picture. Here's President Reagan welcoming some of the Mujahideen to Washington, D.C., talking to them about what they need in their fight against communism. President Reagan was impressed by these individuals and compared them to our own founding fathers. And coincidentally, there is a nice portrait of George Washington hovering over this conversation, if you look at the background of this picture. All right, so obviously the American government is on board with this. So through the CIA, we begin sneaking weapons through Egypt into Afghanistan to the Mujahideen to fight the Soviets. And this is specifically what we give them. This bazooka-like thing that you're looking at here is called a Stinger. A Stinger is a handheld missile launcher that is heat-seeking. So Afghanistan is a very mountainous country. I have never been to Afghanistan. I assume I will never go to Afghanistan. But from the few people who I've talked to who have all been in the military, of course, who have been to Afghanistan, describe Afghanistan as looking something like Colorado. They said if, you know, if it wasn't ravaged by war, there would actually be some great ski resorts in Afghanistan. It's actually quite beautiful. But have that mountain range of a country in your head. Afghanistan is very, very mountainous. So for the Soviets to go into Afghanistan... The best method of getting men into Afghanistan and going into a particular place in Afghanistan is via helicopter. And that's where the stingers come in. The Mujahideen can hide out in caves fighting guerrilla warfare style. When they hear the helicopters show up, they pop out of the caves. They've got their stingers supplied to them by the United States of America. They hone in on them. They, they, they focus in on them. They press the button. That, that, that helicopter is going to try to dodge and weave the missile, but the missile's heat-seeking will hit the helicopter, blow it up, killing everybody on board. And that's what we did. And for the most part, it worked. Uh, this is referred to today informally as Charlie Wilson's War. The CIA called it back in the day Operation Cyclone, and it worked. In February of 1989, the last Soviet soldiers withdrew from Afghanistan. So... Who's now in charge of Afghanistan? Well, the Mujahideen had been supported by the United States of America. 
So they thought that the United States of America would continue to support them in creating a government in Kabul. But we had only secretively supported the Mujahideen, and this was a radically conservative, fundamentalist, Islamic group that really didn't believe in things like civil rights or any type of women's rights. Things like the arts and math and science are not things that were supported by this group of men. And so after the Soviets had withdrawn in 1989, the United States of America pretty much just dusted its hands of this whole situation and withdrew. And the Mujahideen, which was a group of freedom fighters, evolves into a political party called the Taliban. Now, not everybody in Afghanistan was supportive of the Taliban, and so civil war begins in Afghanistan. It continues on through the entirety of the 1990s, going into the 21st century. The Taliban was the political organization. It had its paramilitary wing, the terrorist organization, that was called Al-Qaeda. And as you know, or at least I hope you know, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda began directing their terrorism against the United States of America to destabilize the United States of America. Now, there were many reasons for this that I do not have time to get into in this particular lecture, but suffice it to say this, after the Cold War ends, the United States of America arises as the single superpower. The Taliban and other, some other groups in the region of the world that we today call the Middle East, see the United States as the single superpower that is threatening their lifestyle. And by launching terrorist attacks against the United States of America, they can destabilize the United States of America. So the United States of America will say, okay, we will leave you alone. And the United States will somehow withdraw from Middle Eastern affairs altogether. And the Taliban can have a stronger presence in Afghanistan and perhaps throughout the Middle East. Okay, that is a very general overview there. But it's important to know that for our sake, like what happens in Afghanistan when the Soviet Union invades, the Mujahideen, how they arise, how the Mujahideen evolves into the Taliban. Um, and Al-Qaeda is the, the, the military wing of the Taliban. Uh, the first terrorist acts against the United States of America happened uh, in, in the late 1990s in our embassies in Africa. And then they also attacked uh, an American battleship off the coast of Yemen. And these events happened prior to the big attack, which is, of course, the 9-11-2001 attacks. Looking back on all this in the 21st century, Charlie Wilson said, he said this, and this is his actual quote that I will paraphrase here slightly. Charlie Wilson said, These things happened. They were glorious and they changed the world. But then we screwed up the end game. All right, so what's going on in the Soviet Union while all this is happening? Well, throughout the entirety of the 1980s, the Soviet economy was not good. Now, in order to understand this, let's talk about the structure of the Soviet economy. The Soviet Union has their socialist command economy, which works like this. Well, let's compare it to the American economy. That might make it easier. So here in our American economy, our economy is based upon a capitalist system which means that there is a free market. So the government is, for the most part, not involved. So take a basic item that we all need. Let's take shoes, for example. Now, we all need shoes or some sort of footwear. Who provides these things for us? Well, not the government, but instead, a company will form. Let's say that company of, like, Reebok or Brooks or you know, Dockers or whatever, whoever makes shoes, and, you know, they form a company and... They form an industry and they manufacture shoes and a wide variety of styles and sizes and such. And then there are shoe stores and we go to this, you know, we, we go to the mall and we go to a shoe store and we buy ourselves a pair of shoes that we like and that are comfortable. All right. And that's how it works for the most part, generally, in our country, the United States of America. That is not how things worked in the Soviet Union. Here's how things worked in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, the government of the Soviet Union would identify how many people were living in the Soviet Union at the time, about how many shoes and boots and et cetera that they would need. And then the government would command their manufacturing plants to make shoes. After the shoes and the boots and everything else were made, then they would be placed on trucks and distributed 
to stores that are also run by the government throughout the Soviet Union. All right, so that's how things worked in the Soviet Union. And hopefully that term then, command economy, makes sense. The government is commanding what is produced and what is sold and where it is sold, etc. So when you get to the early 1980s, you've got the United States of America who's upping the, the nuclear arms game. You've got, some, you've got an, a war going on in Afghanistan. And the, and the government is having to make decisions. You know, do we make more machine guns or do we make shoes? And they're mostly choosing to support the military. So basic consumer goods are not being produced like they should be for the average Russian, the, the average Soviet citizen to live comfortably. So this particular image, if you can look at it here for a second, this was a very common image of the Soviet Union in the 1980s. Very, very, very long lines. Here's what would happen. Here's what daily life would be like for you in the Soviet Union in the 1980s. There would be the government store in your town or in your local neighborhood, and the line would begin forming. And you'd, you'd ask people, okay, what was delivered today? And they might say, well, shoes came in today, or pants came in today, or coats came in today, or toilet paper came in today, or toothpaste came in today. Like you don't really know what's coming in. You just know that it's an, something that you need. And most likely, probably a mom or a dad would get in line and they'd wait, you know, potentially half a day, but at least like an hour or so. And, and to, they'd finally get into the store and let's say it's shoes. You'd try to buy shoes that would, for your whole family. But, you know, you might not get exactly the right size or something that's comfortable or that even you like. You sort of get whatever's available. And that's what life was like. Now, you can imagine, like, the how you would actually realistically deal with this. First of all, wouldn't you want to cut in line? There were a lot of fights that happened in this line. And then, what if you knew somebody who worked in this government store? Well, wouldn't you want to bribe them to maybe put some stuff aside for you? This situation just bred corruption. And then think of this. What if you were a real tough guy? You could get your hands on, I don't know, a couple of guns. Imagine you could hijack some of these trucks that are delivering these goods. Steal those goods, sell them, make your own money, create your own black market. That happened too. And you had the rise of Russian gangsters in the 1980s. All this bred a terrible situation in the 1980s to the point that the Soviet people would chant, we can't go on like this. We can't go on like this. Now, where's Brezhnev during all this? Well, Brezhnev, by the time the 1980s rolls around, he is old, he is senile, he is just he is deterior deteriorating. After he passes away, you have two completely useless Soviet leaders, Andropov and Chernenko. Chernenko was in particular a joke. He was an old man at the end of his life. He, he literally tried to rule the Soviet Union from a hospital room. But these were two old guys who were completely detached from the situation of the average Russian. So when Chernenko dies in 85, the Politburo, the Communist Party in Moscow, decides to select a successful agricultural reformer to be the next leader of the Soviet Union. This man was Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev was a very different type of Politburo member. And what made him different was, was that his dad was not a member of the Politburo. So by the time you get to this point in Soviet history, the guys running the Soviet Union, the Politburo, they had largely received their positions because of their families. So maybe their dads were high-ranking communists under Stalin. They had survived the purges. Uh, so they had gotten to go to the best uh, schools. They were, they, were, they were appointed in high-ranking positions. This is not what Gorbachev's experience was. Gorbachev was raised on a farm, and he and his dad developed agricultural reform practices that were highly successful. Gorbachev talked about when he was a teenage boy, he, would, he was able to listen to a tractor, listen to that tractor, and he would be able to diagnose any problems that it had. I mean, he was, I mean that's kind of an amazing ability. 
but he was a farm boy. But because he and his dad introduced these new methods of reform that were highly successful and they were implemented around the Soviet Union, the Soviets start growing more food, Gorbachev became very popular. Um, he went to Moscow State University, gets into politics, and gets into eventually the agricultural department, agriculture department in the, the Soviet government and becomes a member of the Politburo. And he's respected. He's a very respected reformer and a true communist. But when Gorbachev was selected to be the next general secretary of the Central Communist Party of the Soviet Union, there was talk in the White House in the United States. This is a different type of Soviet leader. So I want to show you a picture of Mikhail Gorbachev here. Here's a picture of Mikhail Gorbachev and his wife, Raisa Gorbacheva. And as I'm looking at this picture, I'm realizing I spelled Raisa's first name wrong, so I apologize, Raisa Gorbacheva. But this is uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and his wife, Raisa. By looking at this picture, you should be able to tell, even though none of us here are experts on Soviet leadership, this guy is different. What makes him different? Two things should stand out. One, he's smiling. Two, he's with his wife. How many pictures have you seen of Joseph Stalin with his spouse before he likely killed her? Or, you know, Khrushchev for that matter. You haven't because wives were not part of the picture, literally. But Mikhail Gorbachev actually relied upon Raisa. First of all, he was desperately in love with her. He really fell head over heels in love with her when they met in college. And they loved each other their whole life long. And he actually, she actually advised him on some of his policies. So there's that. And he's smiling. He would tell jokes. And during Chernenko's funeral, the vice president of the United States, who was George Bush Sr., at the time, and the Secretary of State of the United States came back and they met with Reagan. They, they were like, we, Gorbachev's going to be the next leader. And he's different. He's different. He's very different. He smiles. He laughs. He tells jokes. This is a different type of Soviet leader. This is somebody we can talk to. All right. Now, for, from Gorbachev's perspective, he was a man of the people who genuinely had concerns with all these long lines and this desperate living of the people. He saw this as a breeding ground for the revolution. So um, here's Mikhail Gorbachev. Here's a picture of a grocery store in the Soviet Union, which could have been any grocery store in the Soviet Union from the 1980s. The command economy is clearly not working. If you're in Mikhail Gorbachev's shoes, what would you do? How would you provide a better life for the people of the Soviet Union? Now, one thing you could do is you could do nothing. Let the people stand in long lines hate the government, have a black market and gangs emerge. You could do nothing. Or would you reform? And if you tried to reform, what exactly would you do to reform? Mikhail Gorbachev believed in this call, we can't go on like this. And he does want to initiate reforms. Now the question is, how do you reform the Soviet system? And can you reform the Soviet system and not collapse the Soviet system? Gorbachev is an amazingly interesting, complex world leader. Some people love him. Other people hate him. You sort of have to know the whole story to make your own judgment of him. I've spent a lot of time thinking about Mikhail Gorbachev. I'm personally very fascinated by him. One thing that we know is that he was a true believer in Marxist communism. He's certainly not a Stalinist. I don't even think he's much of a Leninist. I think he is an old school Marxist. And, and this comes out in his writings and his speeches when he, when, he, when he accentuates two things, democracy and socialism, democracy and socialism. So by democracy, he means people should be free. And that's something that Karl Marx really believed, not so much Lenin and Stalin or Trotsky. Um, he believes people should be free to do whatever it is they want to do. So he believes in democracy. And then he also believes in socialism. Socialism means economic equality, that part of people being free is you're not going to have this powerful bourgeois class that controls the economy. So in other words, people should be economically equal, but they shouldn't be under a state dictatorial control. They should be free. So Mikhail Gorbachev sees himself as somebody who really can implement Marxism 
into the Soviet system. More democracy, more socialism. Okay, so can he do this? There were two policies that he developed. It's worth noting that Raisa, his wife, uh, helped him develop the names for these policies and the policies themselves. These two policies were glasnost and perestroika. Glasnost is the Russian word for opening. So we're going to open Russia up. How are we going to open Russia up? Uh, freedom of travel and freedom of expression. Go anywhere you want, say anything you want. And yes, say anything you want. So freedom of expression, freedom of journalism. This is definitely not Soviet oppression of the people. You don't like the government? You want to speak out against the government? Go ahead. Is anything going to happen to you? No, it's not. So Gorbachev is going to let the genie out of the bottle. The second reform is called perestroika. Perestroika is the Russian word for restructuring. Now, there's sort of two aspects of perestroika that I focus on. One is the economic aspect. If you would like to form a new business on the side, you may. So you want to make shoes? Go ahead and make shoes and sell shoes on the side. So this seems to be a return to Lenin's NEP idea that we can have socialism but sort of create a free market on the side as well. That's the first part of perestroika. The second part of perestroika is the Soviet Union will now no longer dictate to the to the Eastern European Warsaw Pact countries what to do. So Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, you're free. Do whatever it is you want to do. We're not going to send in the tanks anymore. There's not going to be another Prague Spring. So Brezhnev doctrine is done with perestroika, except, however, the war in Afghanistan does go on with Gorbachev for a few years. Okay, so that's what Gorbachev does. These things were significant changes in Soviet policy. For Gorbachev, these two things represent true and genuine communism. For the hardliners in the Politburo, these things are awful. These things are going to collapse the Soviet government. These things are going to introduce capitalism into the Soviet Union. Both dissidents and gangsters who are running a black market are going to get legitimized and they're going to be the ones who are going to rise up and start taking over the Soviet Union. But for the people in the Soviet Union at the time, there was a spirit of excitement for most of them. Like, wow, things are going to change. Things are going to possibly get better under Gorbachev. Now, this doesn't last, the spirit of, of excitement, but um, it, it, does, it definitely signaled a, a major time of change and reform in the Soviet Union. Now, over here in the United States of America, we were ecstatic about this. Uh, Gorbachev was, reformed, was referred to informally in the United States of America and throughout most of the world as Gorby, and we love him. It seems like the Cold War is going away with Gorbachev and Glasnost and Perestroika. So immediately, President Reagan wants to meet Mikhail Gorbachev. So Mikhail Gorbachev came to power in the summer of 85. That fall, the two men met for the first time in Geneva, Switzerland. Man, haven't we talked about Geneva a lot throughout European history? The theocratic state of John Calvin, the town of Rousseau. It's where Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. It becomes the home of the League of Nations in the 1920s. Geneva, the French-speaking city of Switzerland. And this city becomes the site of the first Reagan-Gorbachev summit in the 1980s. These two men met. Now here's all I have to say about the Geneva summit. When these two men met for the first time, they were allotted a certain period of time on their schedule just to talk to each other. So they went into a room with a translator and they talked. The door was shut, all of the aides and everybody else were outside. After that period of time was over, the two men did not emerge. Laughter was heard behind the door. These two men, who both loved to tell jokes, were making each other laugh. An aide for the United States of America said, well, they've gone over their time. We have a conference to get to. We need to interrupt them. The American Secretary of State looked at the American aide and said, if you open that door, you're fired on the spot. Don't you understand what's happening here? The leader of the Soviet Union and the leader of the United States of America are becoming friends. And they were becoming friends. This was an amazing time in history. It was a wonderful time in history. 
there was a sense that with these two men, who are very different men, one is a very conservative cowboy Hollywood actor Republican, and the other is a Marxist communist, and they find that they enjoy each other's company. That is a wonderful thing. And the one thing with all of their ideological differences that both of these men agree on is an end to the nuclear arms race. Both of these men have a very clear understanding of what nuclear missiles will do to the world. So, when they meet the following year, they meet in Reykjavik, Iceland. And for this particular meeting in Reykjavik, Ronald Reagan goes into this meeting with an incredible plan. Here is what goes down in Reykjavik in 1986. Reagan tells Gorbachev that he has a plan. This plan is called Zero Option. What Zero Option is, is a plan for the United States of America and the Soviet Union to lead the world in getting rid of all nuclear weapons. Zero means zero nuclear weapons throughout the Earth. The United States of America would get rid of all of its nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union would get rid of its nuclear weapons. And because of the power and strength of the United States and the Soviet Union combined, they would be able to force other countries with, the, with nuclear weapons, countries like France, Israel, the United Kingdom, to also get rid of their nuclear weapons so that nobody would have nuclear weapons anymore and that we eliminate the possibility of any type of nuclear exchange. We save humanity. It is a very simple plan. It's a plan that literally I think a kindergartner could come up with, like, hey, if nuclear weapons are so bad, let's just get rid of all of them. And, and this is literally what Ronald Reagan goes to the table with when he meets Gorbachev and Reykjavik in 86. Gorbachev hears this and is all on board. And he says, I will agree to zero option under one condition. Ronald Reagan says, let's hear the one condition. Gorbachev says, you have to get rid of your SDI plan, the Star Wars plan, to put satellites with laser beams on them in outer space. And Reagan said, but I don't understand. That's, that's a defensive program. And it's not a nuclear program. It's an anti-nuclear program. And I've promised the American people that I want to do this, that I want to defend the United States of America from any nuclear attack. Gorby says, no, you're putting weapons in outer space. Abandon SDI, get rid of it. Now, for what it's worth, SDI is only in the most nascent stages of development. I mean, we don't know how to do any of this yet. It, it, it doesn't really exist. It's just a congressionally funded project where engineers are just coming up with basic designs in terms of how this is going to work. It's, it's nothing. It's, it's not even in the laboratory yet. But Reagan, Reagan can't let it go. And he tells Gorbachev, no, I'm not going to let go of SDI. And so Gorby says, well, then no deal for zero option. Reagan says, okay, okay. How about if I give you SDI? We develop it. We'll give you SDI so that you can have your own satellites in outer space. And, and Gorby says, no, we are not going to take weapons in outer space. Reagan, if you believe in zero option, get rid of SDI. And Reagan has this moment of, 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 of panic. And he is sitting next to the American Secretary of State at the time, and he scribbles on, on, a, on a pad of paper, uh, am I right, question mark, and slides it over to him. And the American Secretary of State looks at it and writes back, yes, and slides it back to Reagan. And Reagan says, I can't abandon SDI. So if you're looking at your screen right here, here's the, uh, the cover of Time Magazine. It says, it says, no deal, Star Wars sinks the summit. Both of these men left this meeting angry. And it was clear to the press as they're taking pictures that something bad had happened. This was very different from Geneva. They both were dedicated to making a radical change for the human race, and they failed. And they failed. And both, side, both sides felt like they were in the right. But this is, I mean, an amazing moment in history where we could have gotten rid of nuclear weapons, if that was at all possible. It would have happened here, but it didn't. 
Now, Gorbachev has since said that this meeting was a success, and he said this really quickly afterwards, because the conversation has begun to, uh, to reduce nuclear weapons. And Reagan did agree with that statement. But it is not long after this that Reagan wants to put additional pressure on Mikhail Gorbachev to create a more peaceful world. And for Ronald Reagan, this means a world where people are more free. So, three quarters of a year later, Ronald Reagan travels to West Berlin, stands in front of the Brandenburg Gate, and delivers probably his most iconic speech of the 1980s, at least in relation to the Cold War, and demands of Mikhail Gorbachev that if he truly believes in glasnost, if he truly believes in democracy and people being free, to also come to Berlin to tear down the Berlin Wall. Let's take a listen to the speech. Behind me stands a wall that encircles the free sectors of this city, part of a vast system of barriers that divides the entire continent of Europe. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Mr. Gorbachev did not go to East Berlin to tear down the wall, but here's what he did do. A few months later, in December of 1987, he arrived in the United States of America, where he and Ronald Reagan signed a series of treaties that eliminated a whole class of nuclear missiles and significantly reducing the number of nuclear weapons that both countries had. This was 1987, the end of 1987. It was monumental. The United States and the Soviet Union were both getting rid of their nuclear missiles. Not completely yet, no zero option, but this was signaling to the world that the leaders of both of these countries were committed to creating a more safe, nuclear-free world. It certainly felt like the Cold War was coming to an end. But the big year was 1989. And 1989 was very significant because Glasnost and Perestroika were put into full effect in 1987. And it was two years later in 1989 where the full fallout of Glasnost and Perestroika took effect. So, okay, what happened because of Glasnost and Perestroika? So first I want to talk about what happens within the Soviet Union. And this is a fun picture that I found of the actual Russian mafia. Uh, it's a more recent picture, I believe from Ukraine. Uh, these look like guys who I wouldn't want to mess with. But so, okay, Glasnost and Perestroika led to the rise of the Russian mafia because Perestroika had said, okay, we're still going to have a command economy. We're still going to have the Soviet government determining, okay, how many pairs of pants do we need to make? How many shoes do we need to make? How many, how many shirts? Whatever. And we're going to you know, send these directives out to our manufacturing facilities, and they're going to, we're going to ship them all over the Soviet Union to our people. You know, that command economy is still in place. We are still going to have socialism. And in fact, Gorbachev said we're going to have more socialism. But he said also more freedom. So, you know, more socialism and more democracy, as he would say. So by democracy, what he means is freedom for the people to do whatever they want. So if you want us on the side to also make stuff and sell stuff, then go right ahead. And this will help boost the Soviet economy. Now, but even before Gorbachev arrived on the scene, you had the emergence of a black market, which meant gangsters who were stealing from the Soviet government, who were bribing government officials, and all this was going on, and a whole black market was being created. Well, with the implementation of perestroika, 
this black market and these gangsters were just legitimized. These guys are now no longer gangsters. They're businessmen. And when you see these individuals rising up in power and prestige in their community, it upset a lot of Soviet people, especially people who considered themselves to be good communists. So some people are very critical of, of Gorbachev's plan in this, in this regard, that, in that they think there should have been a more structured way of gradually introducing capitalist reforms or more economic freedom into the Soviet Union instead of just saying, hey, you know, go ahead and make money. Whoever wants to make money, make money. Because these gangsters were already out there and he just legitimized them and it upset a lot of Soviets. All right. But the other aspect of perestroika was the Soviet Union is not going to try to control the Eastern Bloc countries. And the spirit of Glasnost is that communism should reform itself to allow for greater freedom of expression. And when you get to May of 1989, this is this, these ideas have gotten into the other big communist country in the world, China. And in May of 1989, there were student demonstrations across 700 cities in China. The biggest one being a demonstration of thousands of mostly young people in uh, Beijing, China, in the capital, in a huge government park called Tiananmen Square. And these students were protesting for more freedom of expression and reform. So in other words, they wanted glasnost and perestroika in China. Now, the Chinese Central Communist Party decided to go in a very different direction. They brought in the military. They told the crowd to disperse. If the crowd didn't disperse, they would fire upon them. Some students left. Most left. Some didn't. The military fired upon them. How many students died? Well, it's somewhere between five and 10,000. It was a bloodbath. The result of the Tiananmen Square massacre in June of 1989, when the massacre occurred, was this. Communism still exists in China today. If you go to China and you go onto the internet in China, where the government controls internet and what can pop up with an internet search. If you search for Tiananmen Square 1989 on a Chinese search engine, you are going to get very different results than if you did this on an American search engine, which you could do on your computer right now. You will see all these pictures on an American search for Tiananmen Square 1989. For the, you'll see all these images and, and articles about the protests, and especially one very famous image of a anonymous Chinese man standing in front of a column of tanks trying to stop them. But in China, you won't see any of that. This event is definitely not taught in schools. It's an event that if you talk about it openly, you might find yourself in jail. It's an event that very few young people of your generation who are living in China today know about. So did China reform? Well, interestingly, in terms of any type of democratization, any type of glasnost, no. There was no reform at all. But the Chinese government in the 1990s decided that they did have to reform that it was going to be more of a slow, gradual economic reform. So for China, it was less socialism, more capitalism. And in China, this economic reform, I think you can arguably say, worked. China in the 1990s into the 21st century experienced one of the greatest economic booms in world history. So that if you go to Beijing, China today, you're gonna to see Starbucks, Gucci, McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken. They love KFC over there. All these major brand names, uh, as well as, you know, American brand names and as well as, you know, Chinese brand names, they have a thriving economy. But what they don't have is freedom of speech or multiple political parties. And if you attempt to protest the government, you will probably find yourself in jail. There is not a lot of government regulation of the economy. One could probably argue easily that the that China that in China right now they're more capitalist than the United States of America in terms of hey you can start a business you can pay people whatever you want make them work under any conditions that you want government's not going to regulate it but they have taken away some standard things that are that, that are usually standard in any socialist country like universal education and universal health care. 
these two things, which were available for to every Chinese citizen in the early 1990s, is now available to no Chinese, well, or at least not provided by the government to any Chinese person by, you know, 10 years later when you get to the early 21st century. So that is how China responded to Glasnost and Perestroika and the, and the wave of reforms that happened in the late 1980s in the communist world. And what China and Tiananmen Square of 89 does for the communist world is it provides a model. If you don't want to fall to these democratic reforms, here's what you have to do. When there are protests, you slaughter your own people. And there is always this Chinese option. So what happens in Eastern Europe? What happens in places like Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia? Well, without fail, in absolutely all of the Eastern Bloc countries, all of the Warsaw Pact countries, the people rose up demanding reform. There were marches in the streets everywhere. Now, any time during the Cold War era this had happened before, the government could always go to the Soviet Union and said, we need help putting this down. Think Hungary, 56. Think Poland, 56. Think Czechoslovakia, 68. And the Soviet Union would show up to support the communist dictatorship. Now, when these governments called upon Mikhail Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev said, no, you're on your own. You deal with your own country. And these leaders had to decide, do we kill our own people like the Chinese government did? Now, in the mass protest, there were people that got hurt and killed in every country. So I can't sugarcoat this and say, oh, all the people rose up and the government said, okay, we're free now or the Soviet Union is gone and we can do whatever we want and everything's wonderful, hooray. It didn't go down as seamlessly as that. But overwhelmingly, there was a peaceful removal of the Communist Party from power in most of the Eastern European states. The most famous of these happened on November the 9th, 1989, at the Berlin Wall in Berlin. Once people were able to pass through the Berlin Wall without consequence, this signaled the end of the Iron Curtain and pretty much the end of the Cold War. Okay, so what happened? How did this monumental event occur? Okay, so this is a great story. On the screen right now, you have a map of Eastern Europe. If you're able, look at this map, find Hungary. The collapse of the Berlin Wall and of communism in Eastern Europe starts with Hungary. Now we've talked about the country of Hungary a lot throughout European history, and you know that throughout most of uh, European history, it's been ruled by Austria. So find Austria on this map. It's not labeled, but it's right there to the west of Hungary. Hungary and Austria share a border. All right, so you see that. Here is the Prime Minister of Hungary in 1989. His name was Miklos Nemeth. In the spring, this is the spring of 1989, this is before Tiananmen Square, Nemeth has heard Mikhail Gorbachev tell him directly and all of the leaders of Eastern Europe, of the Eastern European country, you do whatever you want. You do whatever it is you want. Miklos Nemeth is the first really to see what he can do, what he can get away with, to see if Gorbachev is true to his word. So, Austria and Hungary were divided by a barbed wire fence that people were not allowed to cross. This fence was the border between their two countries. Nemeth sends the military out, as you see here in this, in this picture, to cut down the barbed wire fence, open up the border between Hungary and Austria. The fence gets cut down. The news reporters show up from both sides and report this. And Nemeth talks about how he waited in his office the next day. He thought for sure the Soviet ambassador was going to show up and say, what are you doing? And Nemeth said, nobody ever came to talk to me. Now, after the news reports this, a whole lot of East Germans who had been separated from their families who were living in West Germany, which was free, they decided to go on vacation to Hungary that summer. So in the summer of 89, summer of 89, you had all these East Germans going to Hungary 
They walked across the border into Austria. They went to the West German embassy in Vienna and they declared that they defected and they wanted to become West German citizens. And the chancellor of West Germany, a man at the time named Helmut Kohl, Chancellor Kohl said, yes, you may all become citizens. So a rush of East Germans down to Hungary continued. Now, look at this map. Here's the map of Eastern Europe. So you see where East Germany is, you see where Hungary is, south of East Germany. Well, to stop this flood of East Germans going into West Germany, Czechoslovakia shut down its borders with Hungary. So the East Germans went to Prague, where there was another West German embassy, and they tried to get into the embassy, begging for asylum in West Germany. Once again, Chancellor Kohl said, yes, you may all come to West Germany, thus encouraging the flood of East Germans into West Germany. But Czechoslovakia also blocks any travel going from East Germany into Czechoslovakia. So now the East Germans begin protesting in the fall of 89 throughout East Germany to open up the borders into West Germany. And this would include opening up the Berlin Wall in Berlin. So we now go to Berlin in November of 1989. Who is the head of state for East Germany? It's this communist dictator, Erich Honecker. Erich Honecker has to decide what to do. He had spoken to Gorby a couple of times, and Gorby had said, you are on your own. You take care of East Germany. You do what's right for East Germany. But you do not have access to the Soviet military to support a dictatorship anymore. How does Eric Honecker respond to the situation? Well, he can't. He doesn't know what to do. So he quits. And he goes into retirement in the Soviet Union, far away from East Germany. His replacement was this particular man who you don't have to know, this guy with his uh, big teeth. He was known for his big teeth and his big smile. His name was Egon Krenz. Egon Krenz probably got the job because he was an affable man. He was kind. He smiled. And they thought, well, maybe you're Gorbachev-like enough that you can be a, the next great communist leader of East Germany. But Egon Krenz didn't know how to handle the situation any better than Eric Honecker did. So what happens next? in early November of 1989, simply highlighted the inefficiency of the East German communist government and how they just didn't know what to do with their own people that were rising up in protest and demanding to travel into West Germany. So here's what happened on November the 9th, 1989. The East German government issues a long statement about reforms that, is that it is going to make. Included in these reforms were lifting travel restrictions. So the East German government stated that it was going to lift travel restrictions. What it did not say is when it was going to lift travel restrictions. Once this government report had been written up in this long bureaucratic statement, it was handed to this low-ranking communist official, a man named Gunter Schabowski, to read to the press. He had not read it before. He has no vested interest in this. He simply reads it aloud to the press. So a huge press conference was there. The American press was there. Our country's press was there. As this communist official reads this long, drawn-out bureaucratic statement, about these reforms that they're going to make and included in the reforms are going to be lifting travel restrictions. Well, after it's all done, this poor communist official who's reading this for the first time has, gets, gets assailed with questions. And, the, and the, most, the biggest question is, is when? When are these travel restrictions going to, going to be lifted? And he doesn't know. So he kind of like hems and haws around a bit. He's like, I, uh, didn't I say it? Isn't it in here? And then he says... Immediately, in German, yet so forth, he assumes that these reforms are going to happen immediately. As soon as he says this, the press announces it. East German citizens, and this was at night, this was the evening of November 9th, 1989, they rush to the Berlin Wall. All right, so you get to the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall is, is, is guarded by the state police of East Germany, or people who are called the Stasi. The Stasi have 
one job, and that is to shoot and kill anybody who tries to cross over into West Berlin without the appropriate visas or paperwork. That's their only job. And now these guards are fi find themselves surrounded by literally tens of thousands of East Berliners saying, we have a right to go through, we have a right to go through. They're like, we, they'd never heard anything about this. They've, they've received no orders. They only have their one standing order, kill anybody who tries to cross. But they're looking at literally thousands of these people. And so, you know, they get on their phones to call in, to ask, you know, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? But they don't get any direction whatsoever. And then finally it happens. One Stasi has a what the hell moment, lifts up the gate, and allows the East Berliners to begin walking through. And once the East Berliners walk through and they make it to the other side, they find that on the other side, West Germans have conglomerated to clap and applaud them, to hug them, hand them flowers, <laughs> some of them did, and greet them into West Berlin. This goes on all night into the morning of November the 10th. The American press is there. The international press is there. This is getting broadcast around the world. And then famously, the West Berliners go home, get whatever implements of destructions they can to go to the wall to begin the process of tearing it down. This was the big moment that symbolized the end of the Cold War. Let us watch a brief film clip of this event. Ab sofort. Also Genossen, mir ist jetzt hier also mitgeteilt worden, dass eine solche Mitteilung heute schon verbreitet worden ist. Sie müsste eigentlich in Ihrem Besitz sein. Das tritt nach meiner Kenntnis, ist das sofort. Unverzüglich. The news flashed around the city. East Berliners rushed to see if the checkpoints in the wall were really opening. The border guards were baffled. We didn't get any instructions from our superiors, none. Only observe the situation. We tried many times to speak to our superiors, but nobody got back to us. You have to bear in mind that our soldiers were fully armed on this day, as always, and they had one order. That order was to stop anyone trying to escape. But the crowds were huge now. Suddenly, the guards gave in. They opened the barriers. opened the borders and didn't take any countermeasures. They didn't consult me or get my approval. I found myself in a group of people who were applauding. I didn't understand right away why. Then I realized I really was in West Berlin, and West Berliners had come to the border, and they were applauding us. We were all crying and embracing each other. Even now, when I look back, my heart is racing. It was so moving. Bekannte, die wollen mal besuchen, die warten uns zwei Stunden. Ja, 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 ja. Nur mal gucken. 
Ist traumhaft. Und dann wieder zurück. Wann? Ne, heute irgendwann. Oder also besser gesagt, doch heute. Wahnsinn! Wahnsinn! Das ist toll. Das ist toll. 28 Jahre, das ist die Stunde. Ich bin sehr glücklich. West Berliners arrived from the other direction. They began to demolish the wall in front of the Brandenburg Gate. Also die Idee, auf der Mauer herumzuhacken, die kam irgendwie, das war so eine There was a common idea. Now we have to get rid of the wall. Diese Werkzeuge kamen ja aus der Gruppe und everybody had different reasons. Jetzt müssen wir die Mauer wegkriegen. Und um, jeder hatte wahrscheinlich andere. For me, it was that I had relatives on the other side who couldn't come over. Man kannte, dass man eben nicht, wenn man wollte, zusammenkommen konnte. Oder wenn ich an meine Tante denke. When I remembered my aunt and how I couldn't see her before she died, it made me so angry. It was liberating to do something against the wall. Da Kommunismus ist gestorben. Wir wir leben mit rüber. Die SED ist tot. Ja, wir da lebt er noch. Ja, Alter. Hammer mit so einer Zähne. It was emotional for me, but I must confess that I had in mind not overreacting. The stupidest thing that any president could do, could have done then would have been going over there, danced on the Berlin Wall, and stick his fingers right into the eyes of the Soviet military and of Gorbachev. Now, who knows how they would have had to react? Next morning, I got a phone call. They told me what had happened. I said, you made the right decision, because how could you shoot at Germans who walk across the border to meet other Germans on the other side? So the policy had to change. Across this wall, two worlds had faced each other in arms. Now their enmity was dumped into history. Germany would be reunited. But Europe's revolution against communism was not yet done. Today, if you visit Berlin, there's not much left of the Berlin Wall. And it's really hard to tell where East Berlin was and where West Berlin wa was. And in fact, Berliners actually have to fight to keep sections of the Berlin Wall up because there are other Berliners who want to knock them down to develop to develop uh, you know places in West Berlin for like new apartment buildings and new shops and such. And so it's a bit of a historical irony that at one point in time, a lot of Berliners wanted to knock down the Berlin Wall. Now they have to fight to keep sections of it up so that future generations will be reminded of their history. The one country that tried to implement a Chinese policy of slaughtering their own people who were rising up in rebellion was Romania. The dictator of Romania was this man. His name was Nicolae Ceausescu. He did attempt to slaughter his own people until the military refused and he tried to escape out of his presidential palace by a helicopter. Eventually he was captured by his own people. He was placed on trial and then summarily executed. One by one, the Eastern European countries break free from communism. In 1990, the first free elections are held in Poland. Lech Walesa is out of prison and was elected the first non-communist president of Poland. He served in that position from 1990 until 1995. Lech Walesa is still alive today. What happened in Prague, Czechoslovakia is called the Velvet Revolution. It was called the Velvet Revolution because there was some fear that there was going to be slaughter on the streets of Prague when the streets of Prague, and especially Wenceslas Square, was filled up with masses for the first time since 1968. There was fear that there was going to be slaughter, and there was not. There was a peaceful revolution, 
And that's why they called it a velvet revolution, because velvet is smooth. Alexander Dubček, who was still alive, they thought he might be the next free president of Czechoslovakia. But no, there was somebody who was much more celebrated and much more famous, one of the authors of Charter 77 and the author of The Power of the Powerless, seen here hugging Alexander Dubček. Václav Havel had become much more popular. And on the streets of Wenceslas Square and throughout Prague, posters were waved of Václav Havel and a phrase was uttered, Havel Nachrad, Havel Nachrad, which means Havel to the castle. Havel greeted the, the masses in the streets of Wenceslas Square, and he addressed them, reading a statement encouraging them to not seek any vengeance on any of the communist leaders who'd been so oppressive to them before. And in fact, some people had died in 1989 in Prague, even at the very end, right before Václav Havel uh, assumed power. And Václav Havel called upon people to be better than their enemies and to not kill them. And the crowd cheered, Havel Nachrad, Havel Nachrad, Havel to the castle. So we return back to this castle, the Prague castle. When Havel arrived, he found rooms upon rooms upon rooms, empty and barren except for a few papers, after nearly 50 years of communist bureaucratic rule. Supposedly, Havel got around using a red scooter and would ride this red scooter through the halls of the castle. I have searched endlessly for a photograph of this, but I cannot find it. Václav Havel became the first president of a free Czechoslovakia. He was president from 1989 to 1992, and then he was out of power very briefly and was back in power from 93 to 2003. I love the story of Václav Havel because he certainly is a unique head of state. This man was a poet and a playwright and a dissident. And when he becomes the leader of Czechoslovakia, what type of leader is he? Well, now here's when things just simply get fun. Always a fan of rock music like the plastic people of the universe, Havel's favorite Western band was the Rolling Stones. So one of the first things he does is he invites the Rolling Stones to play Prague. And here are the Rolling Stones showing up to meet Václav Havel. The next thing he does, or one of the next things that he does, is he requests a visit for the Buddhist Tibetan leader in exile, the Dalai Lama, to come to Prague, where the Dalai Lama and Václav Havel spend an entire day in prayer and meditation. No surprise, Havel is very popular in the United States of America as well. Havel was the president of Czechoslovakia at the same time that Bill Clinton was the president of the United States. Havel first showed up in the United States of America in 1990 to deliver a speech, or at least as president of Czechoslovakia. He'd been here before, but as the first time as president, he visited here in 1990 to deliver a speech to Congress in which he got both Democrats and Republicans to stand up and give him a full standing ovation. Hey, what nice times those were. Here's a fun picture of Václav Havel showing the Clinton family how to dance like a bohemian. Now, one of the neat things about, the, about Václav Havel during the Clinton years was that our Secretary of State during the, in the Clinton administration was this woman. Her name was Madeleine Albright. And what makes Madeleine Albright perfect for this time or this moment in history is that Albright is herself Czech. She was born and raised in Czechoslovakia, and then after, the, after World War II was over and she survived the whole Nazi occupation, her family fled to come to the United States of America. So she's Czech. And so when Václav Havel showed up, he was able to develop a very positive relationship with the United States of America, thanks to Madeleine Albright, who is Czech. And she expressed only the sincerest admiration of Václav Havel, something also that's very Havel-like. How about this? Whenever he signed his name, he signed it with a little heart. Tell me one other head of state in all of world history who signed his or her name with a little heart. This is a very different type of world leader. Some would argue, though, he was not perfect. If he did anything wrong in 1989, 1990, when he was forming his first government, uh, he, you could probably say, argue that, well, the one wrong thing that he did was he made up his entire Czechoslovak government 
filled with only people who were who were Czechs. There were no Slovakians in the government were represented in the government. So the region of Slovakia got very upset with this, and they felt like they were not being fairly represent, represented in the in the government in Prague. And so they asked to break off and to essentially secede from the Union. Instead of fighting this, Václav Havel worked cooperatively together with the Slovakian representation uh, that wanted to, to break off uh, from Czechoslovakia. And he coordinated a successful uh, secession and the creation of a new country, Slovakia, with its capital, Bratislava, in 1993. Because this was a peaceful separation or peaceful split of a country, this is referred to as the Velvet Divorce of 1993. Václav Havel had, in the early 1980s when he was in prison, developed bad pneumonia, compounded with the fact that he was also a smoker, for a lifelong smoker. Hey, don't smoke, kids, it'll kill you. Uh, he died at a fairly young age in December of 2011. A mass funeral was held in downtown Prague with posters of Havel here, Havel Nacharad, Havel to the castle, plastered throughout the city. And hey, guess who decided to show up to play at his funeral? These old guys, the plastic people of the universe, shown here at Havel's funeral in December 2011. Now, the end of communism was not always a good thing for countries in Eastern Europe, in particular this country, Yugoslavia, which you remember is a very multicultural country with a lot of different ethnic groups and religions in it. The one thing a communist dictatorship had done for Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia during the entirety of the Cold War era was it stopped these ethnic groups from fighting with one another. But all that ends in 1989, and one by one, different regions break off to go free. Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia. And when these different regions broke off and went free, extreme ethnic tensions erupted, especially in the regions of Bosnia, Serbia, and the region within Serbia called Kosovo. And these ethnic tensions led eventually to genocide. Although it wasn't called genocide in the 1990s, they called it ethnic cleansing. The worst genocide happened in 1995 in the town of Srebrenica in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where over 8,000 Muslims were slaughtered by Serbians. The Serbs, as you remember, are mostly Eastern Orthodox Christians. They identify as being Slavic and closely culturally related to the Russians. The individual most responsible for these genocides was a man named Slobodan Milosevic, the leader of Yugoslavia, later Serbia. There were so many contested regions within the old Yugoslavia. It was undecided, is this region Serbia, or should it belong to Serbians, or should this region belong to Muslim Bosniaks, and Slobodan Milosevic's response to this was, in all of these contested regions where there are Serbians, just kill anybody who's not a Serbian. And this was ethnic cleansing. Srebrenica was the worst act of violence that had occurred anywhere in Europe since World War II, and sadly, a sign that even after the Holocaust of World War II, when everybody proclaimed, never will we allow this to happen, to happen again, in fact, genocide still happens. Today, the countries that were once part of the former Yugoslavia are now mostly at peace, but that is really only because of an international peacekeeping force, and especially the United States of America. So the collapse of communism within Yugoslavia led to ethnic tensions, genocide, and then a peace, but this peace still remains today a superficial peace. If the United States of America and other international peacekeeping forces decide to withdraw from the countries of the former Yugoslavia, especially Kosovo, likely bloodshed, bloodshed will happen again. And now for the collapse of communism in the most important of the Eastern European countries, the USSR. So communism collapse, collapses in the USSR, not in 1989, but rather in 1991. It was a complicated affair, but here's an easy way to understand it. On this map here, you see a map of the USSR, and you see that the USSR is made up of various federations. So you can think of these as sort of states within the country. 
And the biggest of these is, of course, the one you see here in red, and that's Russia. Okay, so really simply, here's, here's one way to think of it. Imagine if some of these republics within the USSR decide to start break off and going free. So up in the Baltics, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, they say, we, won't, we want to break off of the USSR. Uh, this is a policy of Glasnost, a result of the policy of Glasnost and Perestroika. They openly start saying, we want to break off of the USSR. We now want to become our own country. So let us break off and go free. And protests, you know, those protests start and the Soviet government has to respond to try to put those protests down. But Gorbachev is allowing people freedom of expression. So those protests are able to continue. But okay, all, that are, all, all these things are happening within the various republics of the USSR. Now think of this. What happens if Russia wants to break out of the USSR? What if the government in Moscow says, we don't want to be part of the USSR? Well, I mean, pretty much Russia has always been the USSR. So for Russia to drop out of the USSR means the USSR doesn't exist anymore. And that is really superficially what happened. That's an easy way to understand it. Okay, but the drama that unfolds is, of course, much more complicated than just that. Let's take it to 1991. In 1991, you have freedom of expression, you have glasnost and perestroika, uh, you've got the rise of the Russian mafia, who are no longer the mafia, they're legitimized, and you still don't have a great, strong economy. So the economy, the economic problems had not been solved by, by perestroika. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union is feeling like we're losing the Cold War. The Eastern Bloc uh, countries have broken away. They're all, democ they're, all, they're all democratizing now. And for so many people, there's a sense of, Gorby, you failed us. You failed us in two ways. One, you failed to, sol to solve the economic problems with perestroika, but you, but you did enable the rise of these gangsters to begin controlling businesses. And they haven't helped at all. So there's that problem. And then the other big problem is the hardliners in the Politburo. These guys are like, you are, you're making the USSR extraordinarily weak. We once were a superpower. Now we're nothing. We're crumbling. And it's all your fault. So what happened then was an attempted coup, an attempted government takeover, an attempted putsch, or attempted military takeover, rather, an attempted putsch in August of 1991 in Moscow. Here's what went down. Gorbachev was in vacation down in the Crimean Sea region. While he was on vacation, the phone lines to his home were all cut and the property was surrounded by, the milita by military guards. Gorby and his wife, Raisa, were effectively kidnapped in August of 1991 by Russian military leaders and their allies in the Politburo. Then the Politburo issues a statement that General Secretary Gorbachev is extraordinarily ill and is unable to do his duties as General Secretary, and that certain other members of the Politburo are now in charge of the Soviet Union. Well, Gorbachev still has radio and television, and he finds out about this. So immediately he has Raisa, his wife, video record him. And what you're seeing here, if you're looking at your screen, is a screenshot of Gorby being video recorded by his wife and him giving a statement. I am not ill. I'm perfectly fine. I have been captured. And at this point in time, Gorby assumes they're going to kill me. They're going to say I got really sick and ill and I died. And he wants this to be known. This is not true. And he, he he's trying to plan on how to sneak this video cassette out of the Soviet Union so that the world can know that he was killed. Now, the other response of the Politburo making this general announcement that General Secretary Gorbachev is really ill and he cannot do his duties as General Secretary anymore, the people in Moscow took to the streets to protest what was clearly some sort of government, some members of the government overthrowing Gorbachev and trying to take over. So they took to the streets. So these hardliners send in the military. The tanks roll into the street of Moscow. And now what you have is potentially another Tiananmen Square situation. Will the military fire upon its own people? 
to maintain control. And this was the moment in 1991, in August. So this is an interesting moment. And I want to connect this to another moment previously in the history of the Soviet Union, which was sort of almost the beginnings of the birth of the Soviet Union. And that is February of 1917, or specifically March 8th of 1917 on our calendar. Remember when there were the bread marches? This was the February revolution of 1917, where the women started the bread marches in Petrograd. And the military was called in by Tsar Nicholas II to put down those bread marches and the soldiers were expected to clear the, to clear the square of, of the women bread marchers and their supporters and they couldn't do it and in fact they actually joined the bread marchers and then that was the end of the government. Once a military refuses to obey the commands of a government, then that government is through. Now, the government itself in, in the USSR is a little bit of a strange situation because technically Gorbachev's in charge, but he's been captured by hardliners within the Politburo. So there's clearly division in the government in Moscow, but it's the hardliners that roll in the tanks to put down the uprising that's happening in the streets of Moscow. But what do the soldiers do? And that's when I show you this picture. The soldiers in the August of 1991 these Soviet soldiers could not fire upon their own people. And in fact, they joined them. And here is a Soviet soldier who has taken and is waving the flag of the Russian Federation within the USSR. He is joined with the people. Now, Gorby's nowhere to be found. Obviously, the hardliners in the Politburo realize that their attempt of overthrowing the government hasn't worked. And it's at this particular time where one individual sees a political opportunity. And that individual is Boris Yeltsin. Now, Boris Yeltsin is the head of the Russian Republic in the USSR. So think of him at this particular point in time as like a governor of a state. And he used this moment of the tanks refuse, and, and the soldiers refusing to fire upon the people as an opportunity, a political opportunity for him. He climbs up famously on top of a tank and he delivers a speech denouncing the hardliners in the Politburo and asking, where is Mikhail Gorbachev? And calling upon everybody in Russia to go on a general strike and to not work until the government of the USSR recognizes the freedom of the people of Russia. Boris Yeltsin has spotted an incredible political opportunity for himself here, with various republics within the USSR wanting to break off and go free, recognizing that Gorbachev is nowhere to be found, that the hardliners in the Politburo have tried to forcibly put down and reverse the policies of Glasnost and Perestroika, and to maybe try to do this tough China, Tiananmen Square-like action against its own people that failed. He says, well, this is his opportunity to rise up. Literally stands on this tank, delivers this speech. Eventually, Gorbachev is freed from his imprisonment in his house on the Black Sea, comes back into Moscow where things are in turmoil. And what, what can he do? What can he possibly do in this particular situation? Who, who supports Gorbachev anymore? So later, Gorbachev is addressing the Politburo, talking about his ideas for how the Soviet Union should move forward. He doesn't really get a chance to effectively explain his ideas because he keeps getting interrupted in the most amazing of ways. Boris Yeltsin marches up to the stage, to the lectern, where Gorbachev is speaking, and interrupts him and gives him a list of grievances from the people of Russia about how he has made the situation worse for them and how the people of Russia want to break off from the USSR and go free and have their own country. This is an astoundingly brazen thing to do. Imagine the President of the United States delivering a State of the Union address in January some year when somebody walks up to the president, interrupts him while he's delivering the speech, and tells him, it doesn't matter what you say, nobody here supports you anymore, here are all the reasons why we hate you. 
that would be so incredibly disrespectful and a sign that the government is collapsing. Now, if that's not amazing enough, for me, the other amazing thing about this is Gorbachev's response. Any other Soviet leader, any other Soviet leader, any time in the history of the Soviet Union, would have had Boris Yeltsin either executed or shipped off to a gulag or something. But Gorby doesn't do that. Gorbachev simply said, it is not in my nature to do something like that. That's not the type of person I am. So by the end of 1991, the policies of Glasnost and Perestroika are seen as largely negative in the Soviet Union. Not many people support Gorbachev anymore at all. Boris Yeltsin has seen a political opportunity, gathered support behind him, denounced Gorbachev in, in front of the entire Politburo, putting pressure on Mikhail Gorbachev to resign. Mikhail Gorbachev resigned as the last leader of the Soviet Union on December the 25th, 1991. The following day, there was no USSR, but instead the Russian Federation with most of the other republics from the USSR going free. Here's a brief video clip of that moment. The superpowers had confronted each other relentlessly. Now, under intolerable pressure, one side withdrew. Gorbachev had done as much as anyone to end the Cold War. He called Bush and told him this was his last day in office. There was a kind of sadness. Uh, uh, the finality of it hit me pretty hard, and it was Christmas time and uh, holiday time. And uh, I felt that a friend was was hurt, and I wasn't happy about that. That night, the red flag of the Soviet Union was lowered for the last time. In Washington, Bush made his Christmas broadcast. For over 40 years, the United States led the West in the struggle against communism and the threat it posed to our most precious values. This struggle shaped the lives of all Americans. It forced all nations to live under the specter of nuclear destruction. That confrontation is now over. Boris Yeltsin is the first president of the Russian Federation. The Russian Federation is a democracy with a capitalist economic system. It was a radical departure from the USSR. It was also a brutal shock for most of the former Soviet citizens. Most of the Russians did not handle this transition well, nor could they. All of them had grown up in a political and economic system where the state would provide for you your education, your health care, your job your pension. The command economy by the 1980s wasn't working, but it's still the system that the Russian people knew and understood. And now they were just told, go make money, go start businesses and make money. And they were starting cold for most of them with very little to no capital or material to work with. And arguably the good things of the communist system, pensions, education, Health care, the thing, those things that the state provided were all pulled away. Take a moment to feel for the elderly people in the Soviet in the former Soviet Union in the 1990s. They've worked their whole lives, and then all of a sudden they're told in 1990, I'm sorry, 1991, 92, you don't have your pension anymore. It's not there. You worked your whole life assuming it was going to be there. The Soviet Union would have given it to you, but now we're no longer the Soviet Union. Go figure it out. This was horrible. So go figure, when you get to 1993, the most popular growing political party in the Russian Federation is the Communist Party. They want to bring back some of these elements of security into the people's lives. Boris Yeltsin's response was this. He literally blew up the parliamentary building in, in Moscow. Now, there was nobody in the building at the time, 
the building was empty, but he brought out the tanks and he blew it up. He's like, There's, there'll be no more communism here anymore. Now, this was really weird. Um, he called this, Boris Yeltsin called this shock therapy. Like, you're, we're going to go cold into capitalism and full bore, no state support capitalism. Here's something weird to think about. In the 1990s, the Russian Federation was more capitalist than the United States of America. I mean, we had social services. We've got Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. The Russians didn't even have any of that. They had nothing. It was awful. So you sort of understand people wanting to bring back the Communist Party to, to provide these supports. Anybody in Russia today who remembers the 1990s typically remembers the 1990s as a horrible time in Russia. I mean, there's also the humiliation of having lost the Cold War and the collapse of the USSR. And then add insult to injury. There's even a greater economic depression in the 1990s than there was even when people were standing in those long lines in the early 1980s. And so you have really sad images like this one. Old ladies on the street trying to sell soda pop to make some money for themselves. Of course, there were people with money in Russia at the time. The old gangsters. Yes, this is actually a real photograph. And the wealthiest of Russians were those that were able to take over the petroleum manufacturing plants. And some of those oil barons became the richest men in the entire world. It becomes clear in the 1990s that anybody who wishes to save the Russian economy has to work both cooperatively with these oil barons and control these oil barons, because that's where the money is in Russia. Boris Yeltsin was simply the wrong man for Russia at this time. Aside from the political and economic mismanagement, he was a buffoon. He was an alcoholic who was prone to making a spectacle of himself, sometimes on live television. He inspired confidence in nobody. Russia seems to be a joke. Boris Yeltsin seemed to be a joke. So the 1990s ended on January the 31st, 1999 with Boris Yeltsin announcing to the world that he was going to resign. And when he resigned on the following day, January 1st of the year 2000, the reins of power would be passed to his prime minister, an individual that he had appointed, a man named Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin was a former Soviet KGB officer. The KGB was Soviet intelligence, Think of it as the Soviet version of our CIA. Vladimir Putin was not himself a spy. He was more of a secretary with a desk job stationed in Dresden, East Germany. Not long after being appointed prime minister in 1999, there was a terrorist attack in Moscow. An apartment building was blown up in the middle of the night, killing most of the people inside. The wreckage of this apartment building was quickly cleaned up and Vladimir Putin announced that the apartment building had been blown up by Chechen terrorists. Very few people had heard of the new prime minister before this event happened. After this event happened, most all Russians know about Vladimir Putin. This act of terrorism had stoked Russian pride, and many Russians were inspired by this prime minister's call for vengeance against the potential terrorist in the Russian state of Chechnya. Chechnya is a predominantly Muslim state in the Russian Federation that wanted to break off and go free with other former Soviet republics. Vladimir Putin did work successfully in taking the Russian oil barons under his control and manipulating them for the purposes of improving the Russian economy. For a full decade and a half after Vladimir Putin took over Russia, the Russian economy grew. Most Russians greatly appreciated the new economic stability and distancing themselves from the horrible years of the 1990s. But as the Russian economy grew, Russian democracy withered away. Political opponents and critical journalists of Vladimir Putin found themselves imprisoned or dead. Elections have become a joke, and two decades after he originally took power, Vladimir Putin is a dictator in everything but name. Putin's government still identifies the United States of America as a threat. And sadly, 
In the second decade of the 21st century, many people began to sense that a new Cold War was coming back between the Russian Federation and the United States of America. Many Americans do not trust Putin's dictatorship, especially in some of his bold moves in taking over eastern Ukraine, the Crimea, his interference in the Syrian civil war, and potentially doing other subversive things throughout the world, including possibly interfering with American elections. And on their side, the Russian government doesn't trust the United States of America. And this has to do with what happened to NATO after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, remember that NATO was formed by the United States of America in the late 1940s to protect Western democracies from the Soviet Union. It was, as we remember, a defensive alliance. So if that is the case, then why, the Russians argue, would NATO not disband after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991? Why instead did NATO expand into Central and Eastern Europe? And it's true. In 1991, then-President George Bush Sr. could have said, hey, Cold War is over. Let's get rid of NATO. But that's not how the American government saw NATO, nor really the countries that wanted to, who were already a part of NATO and also wanted to join NATO. NATO was seen as what it had always been, an alliance of democratic countries from a common threat. In other words, if you're part of NATO, then you're a democracy and you have the support of the United States of America. So if you're a little country like Estonia, it's nice to have the military backing of the United States of America. The countries that joined NATO wanted to join NATO. But for the Russians, this is an expansion of American power right up to its borders. We could think of this differently if the roles were reversed. Let's say the United States of America lost the Cold War. NATO collapses, but the Warsaw Pact begins expanding. And the Warsaw Pact takes over countries right on our border. Mexico, Canada, Cuba. And we know that this alliance is controlled by our old enemy. Many individuals in Putin's government today would say this is why we do not trust the United States of America. They should have disbanded NATO, but they didn't. Instead, they expanded it right to our borders. The United States of America is threatening us. No matter how you feel about this claim, it's at least important to understand their perspective. Now, the one thing the collapse of communism did in Europe was it helped to unite all of Europe. The 1990s saw the rise of something called the European Union. The roots of the European Union go all the way back to the very end of World War II. As the American and British militaries led the Allied forces through Western Europe, liberating Western Europe from Nazi rule, the three small little countries of Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg decided to form an economic union where there would be no trade barriers between their three little countries and they would work essentially as one economic country. They call themselves Benelux, short for Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. And it worked. So inspired by this, in the 1950s, the French foreign minister, Robert Schuman said, hey, let's break down all the economic barriers between my country of France, our old enemy, West Germany, and the Benelux region, and Italy, for coal and steel and he helped form the European coal and steel community. Coal and steel could be bought and sold in these countries. It could be traded by these countries without any tariffs or any other economic barriers, and it worked. And Robert Schuman is amazingly credited for working cooperatively with the first chancellor of West Germany, Konrad Adenauer, for finally bringing peace between France and West Germany. And how do they bring peace? They make money together. They broke down those economic barriers. So after the collapse of communism in 1991, in 1992, you have the Treaty of Maastricht establishing a European Union. In 1999, a common currency that was selected to be used by some, but certainly not by all European countries, the euro goes into effect. And Europe starts to become united. So what's the EU mean for people who live in Europe today? Well, it means this. You could be born and raised in Hamburg, Germany, but then you're like, I don't like living in Hamburg, Germany. I'd rather live in Barcelona, Spain. So you can travel to Barcelona, Spain. 
No more border patrols at the stops. Traveling between Germany into France and down into Spain is just as easily as just as easy as traveling from Ohio down through Kentucky into Tennessee. Nobody's there to stop you at the border at the Ohio River as you go from Cincinnati, Ohio to Covington, Kentucky. And there's no such border as you cross from Germany into France anymore. And you can work wherever you want. Having a common currency and being part of the Eurozone does make things a little bit easier as well. I was in Europe for five months in the summer of 19, beginning in the summer of 1996. And I worked in Belgium and I had Belgium marks with me. And then after I worked for three months in Belgium, I traveled around to a wide variety of different countries. I went to France, I went to Switzerland, I went to Italy, I went to Germany, went to the Netherlands. And everywhere I went, I had to go to a bank and I had exchanged my, you know, Belgian francs for, you know, a French franc or a Deutsche Mark or an Italian lira. Now for countries that are part of the Eurozone, you don't have to do that. However, the Eurozone has caused trouble because there are some countries with a really strong economy, like Germany, and countries with a really weak economy, like Greece. And this has caused major problems in Europe, especially after the 2008 global economic recession. Greece essentially went so far into debt that Germany had to lend Greece billions of dollars expecting the, that Greece was going to pay it back. But of course, everybody knew that this wasn't really a loan. It was a gift. Greece would never be able to pay this money back to Germany. The maps that you're looking at here are pre-2016 maps. This is before Brexit. In 2016, by a narrow margin, the people of the United Kingdom voted to leave the EU because of the free travel between, between their country and the rest of Europe and the common laws that they would share with the rest of Europe were not in fact a benefit, but a detriment. The UK wanted to go their own way. There is no one single capital of the EU, but one of the most significant EU cities in Europe is in Brussels, Belgium, or rather is Brussels, Belgium. In this one particular neighborhood here, you see the Schumann Roundabout, named after Robert Schumann. And the principal EU building is this, the Charlemagne building. Named after that medieval king who had a dream of a common, unified Europe under his rule. Now, the EU certainly isn't perfect. However, they have worked and are still working on breaking down economic and political barriers. This means that as we think of the whole history of Europe and all the wars and all the conflicts, the EU has largely put an end to that. So... Not long after Germany bailed out Greece in the year 2010, and many people around the world were wondering, will the EU survive? It's probably no coincidence that the Nobel Prize Committee awarded, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to the EU in the year 2012 to say thank you for helping to make Europe a more peaceful and potentially economically stable place. All those wars, all those conflicts, all the ethnic tensions, all the ideological conflicts. And now there's a greater sense of peace. Now you can grow up in Hamburg, Germany and go live in Barcelona, Spain. Hop in a car in Barcelona, Spain, drive all the way to Estonia, never having to show your passport. And this, Euro Bears, is a wonderful place to end. Thank you for listening to this long lecture on the end of the Cold War. We have now gone over 500 years of European history in as much detail as I could possibly provide it. Thanks for paying attention to, the, to this lecture and to all the lectures. Now it's time to review for the exam. Take care, Euro Bears. Have a great day.